Well, hello everybody. Here we are. We're world's greatest sawmill video. So, what we're up to today is we're having some fun now, just uh, breaking down some um, pines. Whereas everything else that we've been doing so far has been um, iron barks and uh, very, very hard hardwoods. So, I'm just um, working with some soft material for a change. And I wanted to run through a few things for people who um, are considering getting into milling. Um, starting to do a bit of milling or, you know, buying a machine. <clears throat> One of the biggest things with older machines is the design factor of the way they were designed was followed a common evolution. So this mill here is a um, hardwood mill um, GT26, I believe it is. Um, so this mill in its evolution started out as most mills did and they had um, worked on the the width of the cut so the actual supports for the band is actually vertical and non-adjustable so they form you know a maximum cut width okay whereas in all other modern mills the um, one on this side usually runs on a rail and it adjusts across to come in as close as it can to the actual uh, material you're cutting which supports the blade better now, there's nothing wrong with buying a second-hand mill um, as long as it's in good condition. With these guys here, they run a Kohler or engine. This is a 14 horsepower engine, which is tons of grunt, even in the um, the hardwoods like iron bark, which is a seriously hard material. It all works very, very well. But one of the key things that is something that you need to look at between do you save your money and do you buy a um a modern mill even in the in this particular brand they have moved the motor up so the motor goes up much higher up towards the top of the uh, head and they turn the belts coming off this side here and they run them vertically up and then change them at 90 degrees again to run across to the motor to give it a, a very very large square cut between the the two side stops on the new models this side stop is adjustable and then um, they also have um, a big huge square cut here because within this system here you can only do about a hundred millimeters between the blade before you foul on the cowling for the for the protection of the belts and the and the blade so on the new ones they go all the way up here perfectly square to give you about 478 millimeters of clearance on the GT34 model, which would be the one that you'd go for after this one. Now, functionally, as this, as the mill works, I don't have a problem with this mill. And you know, saying to people, well, if you start with something you can buy, and there's not many secondhand mills around. Um, and then you uh, build on that from there once you get used to and knowing how to mill. Because in milling, there's the greatest majority of people are not making money out of milling. Many, many, many people you'll see in here say, I've got 3,000 slabs. I've got 2,000 slabs. Well, if they've got 2,000 slabs or 3,000 slabs, then the slabs can't be very good and the market must be saturated and that's only a couple of people when you put that across the whole uh, industry then there's not much chance that you're going to make money out of buying a mill and milling timber and that's if you can get hold of the timber fortunately for me i can get uh, timber with the crane truck so you know instead of running around with a trailer and trying to you know manhandle the the materials you know the hydraulics make it feasible possible and cost effective to um, acquire the logs and to um, do the work in the in the um, timber now this is a nice pine here it's it's coming up nice i'm happy with it it's there to be made stickers out of it's not um, a, a material that i am seeking to sell or to do something with it's simply to make stickers out of and um, blocks for your bunking and stuff like that to stack your materials on and that's why i'm using this material because it's kinder on the blades and the and the saw and everything else um 
but they're critical things that you need to do. There are certain aspects of this saw that weren't um, weren't up to scratch, but having but that's not a what's the name of the manufacturer. What it is is that this particular block here, which holds the um, idler for the wheel, wasn't strong enough. So I had to get a. Um, this is just a cyclone washer. This is the thing. It's not a not a statement about the um, saw manufacturer. But this block started to collapse on this side. The other side was holding okay. Um, so we reinforced it with a, um, with a decent thick galvanized washer there that now it's, it's working really well, okay? Because if those things aren't holding and you're crushing the tubing, you cannot get a accurate um, adjustment on your wheel and you won't get your wheels to run true. Now that's, again, I'm not saying anything bad about the sawmill because the cost of the sawmill um, versus, you know, some of the really, really expensive uh, fancy mills, of course I'd like one of them at, you know, twenty or $30,000 of some of those fully powered mills. But if you're gonna start into sawing, you need something that is um, cheap, easy, works, and you can adapt from there as you go. But, um, you know, the same on this side, this block here, when you look along the block, you can see how much distortion is in the in the tubing as it goes through there and it's twisting twisting the blocking that way. Like you're looking at that dead dead level, I would say at dead level, and that's the twist that's in it. Now they are all things that were beefed up in the later models as they came along, but I can get this thing tracking straight and true and cutting okay. Um, so it's a good, you know, um, balance between what you can achieve, you know, with what you've got. So that's it. You've got to start somewhere to get to, you know, get something happening. But um, the rest of the sawmill is very basic. The, the way that they work, all sawmills, um, very simple, very basic. And that's all you want. You don't want, um, when you're learning, to be, you know, $30,000 or $100,000 in debt with a sawmill um, while you're learning. Because you may not stick it out and you may not keep um, doing it. You know, you may not have a market to sell your materials at. You know, if you've got 3,000 um, slabs and you've got a problem with oversupply. And that's, you know, there's no good uh, cutting up and you know covering acres and acres and acres of material you can't sell so they're, they're just the warnings um the basis of the way they work their wheels have um little wire brushes knock the sawdust out of the wheels to keep the wheels clean i've had a banister brush this is the side that will get sawdust on it um, i've stopped cutting wet at the moment i was running a banister brush on here which is like a dust dustpan brush, but I may swap over to a paintbrush, and I just run it touching the um, and I run it to a paintbrush because I can get a paintbrush more um, in line with the tracking. Whereas the banister brush kept wanting to roll and turn, and then it would end up hitting the hitting the bunk stops as it goes past. Wasn't a big deal, and it worked really well. Then you end um, up in the situation the only that your cuts that become inaccurate. Sawdust sitting on top so of on that top the rail. And if side you don't here, you have your, your lock stops. So you knock them up, and then up the top here, you have your height adjustment to adjust your height. So you can click out the center thing here, and then you rotate your handle to alter your height. You've got your gauge over here which isn't perfectly accurate, but you can measure on the end of the end of the timber, put your line and then mark up to your line. I see people even with wood misers doing that. But, you know, I think the ones that have the fully um, electronic versions don't do that. But then I surmise you're paying 50 to $100,000 for the, for the um, sawmill, you'd want the accuracy to be correct. But yeah, so that's a, a quick run over it. You know, we've got seven, seven odd meters of cutting capacity length wise. Um, and we've got 540 between the stops. So you can get 540 between here, but if you get any knurls and, and knobs on the side, 
you know, or you want to cut 125 millimeters, you've got to space this across by um, about 50 millimeters off the bunks, off the stops down along the side there. So there's a few tricks. I can cut 175 between here and this. Okay, that's my limiting factor. But you know, no matter how you look at it, the new ones in the 34 are um, supposed to be 478 millimeters between here and the the restriction at the top. So, you know, which is one of the things you'll learn about sawmilling if you do go down the path um, is that um, you've got to consider if you're doing big timbers, you've got to be able to move those big timbers around. And um, in Australia, with iron bark, and I'm pretty bloody strong, you know, I slabbed up some of these slabs that they're only two inches thick. They're 20 foot long, but they're two inches thick. Um, and I am flat out sliding them off the mill, let alone I can't carry them somewhere. They are too heavy. So that's something that you have to decide. If you're going to do big lumber, you have to end up um you know being able to move those things around now i can park the crane truck here and that's how i load my logs on that's how i roll my logs because logs of this size because this has already been um you know had the flitches taken off and you know the sides um three of the sides squared up um hit the hit the mill incredibly hard when you're rotating them so I actually wrap the chains on it and pick it up and rotate it and then put it back down um, to not damage the mill. But that is something that you have to be aware of when you're doing this type of work in this type of environment. And if you decide to start doing big uh, beams, so, you know, I can't imagine what a 478 by 478 square beam would be like to move, even if it was a short one. And that's something that I would say to people too. You know, get to know what your market is. You know, if you're going to do uh, fencing or, or things where it's got a utilitarian process, keep in mind what the, what you're trying to achieve and what your market, um, your market um, is, you know. In those types of things, they have a utilitarian thing, whereas if you're doing slabs, you're doing more decorative and more luxury items if, if you know for want of a better way to describe it so the person who's going to buy those things does like the fancy grain but they usually don't want to pay the money for it um and it's easy to see why people end up with you know two thousand slabs or three thousand slabs you know and then you have people wandering through your home through your um work process just kicking tires and having a look around to see what whether there's any specials there you know well you know you re i can say to people i really strongly say you don't want people coming through tire kicking it's not safe to have them you know on your property when you're doing work and you've got gear or things laying around on the ground they can trip over um and just they're taking up your time if if you're you know trying to sell them something and all they want to do is look at the best specials you have well that tells you that they're not really there shopping very well um and you know on the other side of it a lot of people have too much money um in the um slabs that they're trying to sell and that's not having a dig at people but you know if the market ends up with you with three thousand slabs or even two thousand slabs you know you've got to have a look at what what you're doing as an inventory because most of us just keep cutting after the event so you really really need to get rid of some of that material you know but you know that's my that's my getting on the soapbox about those things you know but there's the other side of it every time you cut these materials up and you look at what what is inside these logs it's a terribly addictive um, thing you know some of the patterns and the wonderful wonderful grains but that's iron bark down there two inch slab of iron bark there in natural edge okay live edge they call it um with the bark removed it's a stunning piece of timber and then you look at these guys over here 
and you see the patterns in the in the uh, grains and stuff like that they are just absolutely beautiful shelving which is um can you imagine your plants sitting on these shelves you know the beautiful green of your orchids and your other um hothouse and um nursery shade house plants the stunning gorgeous ones against those colors because that is bright dark brown chocolate brown when it's um wet when it actually comes up and this material is brilliant in uh, wet environments where it's going to be in those environments and getting wet all the time you've got them on there in the live bark live edge type situations beautiful beautiful uh, patterns in these materials and incredible opportunities for people with different eyes and vision so it gets to be incredibly addictive and i'm not saying to anybody don't you know um get involved in it you know you may want to decorate your own home you know you may want to do things around your own home you know some of these um ones here are just absolutely stunning absolutely stunning and the possibilities are endless whether it's bar tops or uh, shelving behind bars like this stuff here behind a bar that already has a timber top the the grain you've got to see there's some photos with that grain wet i'm not going to wet it again i don't want to keep wetting these things but when you look at them and you're milling them you have the ability to say to people hey listen i'll uh mill it to whatever thickness you want so you can have very chunky shelving behind your bar in that sort of material it just looks gorgeous um and it matches it can you imagine your uh motor oil uh collection and all those different types of collections you have with that type of timber as your shelving instead of a a bloody melamite piece of crap that you know i never knew how many chemicals were in all that stuff um you can't you're not even allowed to burn it because it's so toxic to you and you bring it into your home have it in your home and if you're unlucky enough it catches fire and it kills you you know this timber burns but it doesn't have the toxic um residue that all those other things have so there's interesting things that i never realized and i've i've you know started to see as i've gone along you've got red gums you've got a magnificent array of different different types of um timber but see we need a bigger mill when we get to those guys we're gonna have to run them through the chainsaw mill to break them down to the point that we can get them on the mill but just stunning timber mango over there you've got tallow wood you've got all sorts of um different timbers so that's what we have to look at so if you think about buying a mill consider what you're going to try and sell who you're going to try and sell it to um figure out how you're going to carry it you know that's where i wrote it there so i can do a 340 mil wide at 175 and i can do a 100 mil max depth at 540 but you know get to know what your customers want like there's not going to be many people who are going to want a 100 millimeter slab um in reality i don't believe anyway you know hey if somebody does want it give me a call like i have got um tons and tons of timber that i can run through at that stunning timber you know the only thing is you you want to try and pick up a 50 millimeter wide piece of uh iron bark at 540 wide you're not going to pick it up at 100 mil thick i can tell you now double the thickness not without mechanical means but you know you can always hire other people you can have other people help you um if you choose to you can get forklifts look at that for a stunning log that thing's going to be gorgeous when we open that sucker up and that's what that's what the addiction is you end up in a situation where you know you get a taste for opening these things up and it's just like uh, opening presents at christmas time you know it's a stunning stunning um great fun thing because you never know what it's going to look like inside that one over there look at the size of those red gums absolutely beautiful and you don't worry about the checking on the end because the checking doesn't go in very far it's just the sun dries that part out um fastest 
So that's where it splits, you know. Um, and you'll get some of it from when they drop the tree. Sometimes they drop trees very hard and it um, then is very hard on the materials. But yeah, just to let you know a few different things, a few different possibilities. But don't overlook a mill that's secondhand like that. Um, the possibilities are still a transition. You can do this mill for a while until you can afford a better mill and then upgrade. But, you know, it's a big ask to go right through and uh, afford to pay for a, a really big mill, you know, a really expensive mill, um, when you're starting out. So, by all means, keep that in mind and go, well... I'll start at what I can and then I'll build up from there and if and if the sales and the the um, enjoyment continue then by all means upgrade to the U Butte um, fully functional fully computerized super duper mill I can see the advantage to um, those things and also the widths and sizes so anyway I'm Gary thanks for popping in um, I hope that Help some of you if you do decide that you want to have a crack at some of this because I'm a carpenter um, back in a former life being able to make furniture and make shelving um, horse related fence you know products and round yards stables all those types of things has a major appeal to me because that creative side of you never truly leaves you know so it's an important part of it. But anyway, you keep uh, watching and we'll see how we go, eh?